Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Renewables. We are very excited about this week's episode. We're going to have a great conversation today with Brian Sifton, the Sustainability Program Manager at Black & Veatch, uh, you know, really a, a household name, frankly, particularly if you're from uh, Kansas City, the largest engineering firm in Kansas City, founded in 1915, over 100 years uh, old and 105 years of excellence, which I think is just awesome, uh, and a global engineering firm now with over 10,000 employees. So really looking forward to the conversation today with Brian, who is heading up, um, you know, Black & Veatch's internal sustainability program. And uh, with more than 10,000 employees and offices all over the world, I'm sure you have uh, your work cut out for you. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Brian Sifton. Brian, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, David. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. You, you all are doing some amazing things and uh, just a quick glance at your website, um, some of the services that you list um, are probably, you know, you could make an argument for certainly in the top five or top 10 kind of most important um, issues that the world really faces right now. Decarbonization, uh, hydrogen and its role in the future, sustainability, grid modernization. So we're going to get into all those awesome topics Um Real, really vibes and syncs well with our show and I think what our listeners are, are really looking to get out of these conversations. So really excited to dive into all that. But first, um, give our viewers and listeners a little bit of overview about yourself and your career. Uh, we like to talk college sports on this show. So tell us where you went to college um, and how you ended up at Black and & Veatch and um, yeah, just some kind of overall background for everybody. Yeah, sure thing. Happy to. I'm a I'm a KU graduate. I'm a Jayhawk. All right. Good um, man. and <laughs> I got a. Uh, I like to say I got a sustainability degree before there was such a thing. Uh, so I actually graduated with three degrees: environmental science, economics, and urban planning. So it touches a little okay. bit each of the main areas of sustainability. Um, and I graduated during the last recession. So I got out of school. Was fortunate enough to land a job you know, in, in my area of interest, I landed at a small developer of utility scale wind energy plants. Um, so I got to work with a small team in Lawrence developing renewable energy projects. Um, I got to do that for about a year and a half or so, and then had gotten connected up with some folks at Black and Beach. They actually at the time had some uh, opportunities that they were looking at in renewable energy in the utility scale. And so just through some introductions, got connected to their renewable energy group, uh, joined Black and Beach almost 10 years ago, uh, and really focused on utility scale renewable energy for the first few years I was there. Um, doing some consulting. I'm not obviously an engineer by training, and so uh, I got to support the engineers and constructors on a lot of the work that they were doing. Um, so did that for about five years. For the last five years, I've been a part of a group called the Growth Accelerator, and it focuses on two things, incubating new businesses in Black and & Veatch, and then corporate strategy. Um, we'll talk about the sustainability strategy a little bit more, but um, as I've started taking on that role over the last year or so, uh, there's been this really nice convergence between incubating new businesses, strategy, and now our sustainability objectives. So I've been working on that for about the last year or so. Um, and then prior to that, I was working on um, some programs that identified internal, uh, in, internal entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, people that wanted to start new businesses for Black & Beach. So got a, got a chance to work with a lot of brilliant people at Black & Beach uh, over the past few years. Awesome. And I, I love that the company is sort of constantly evolving and, and it, it letting its employees evolve to kind of stay relevant. That's really what this podcast is all about. Uh, not just renewable energy, but how do companies continue to reinvent themselves and renew their offering to stay maximally relevant and, and really bring the most value 
to your customers. And it looks like you're doing that. When you jump onto the homepage, I just want to quote your homepage here. Um, migrating and adapt, it might not be on the homepage, forgive me if I got that wrong, but migrating and adapting to climate change, decarbonizing supply chains, protecting our water, creating a more diverse and inclusive workforce are just some of the challenges that we are uh, committed to addressing head on. So talk to us about your approach. I know we're going to get into your Accelerate Zero uh, program at some point, which is really cool and easy to find on your all's homepage as well. So I encourage our listeners to go there. But talk about your approach uh, to addressing these hugely important topics uh, internally and then, you know, eventually we'll kind of get to how does that translate to your outside services that you provide your customers? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I get most excited about is how we connect our talented professionals who want to solve problems with the problems our clients need to solve. You know, we work across infrastructure categories. We serve the power industry, the energy industry, water telecommunications, we've got a federal business management consulting, data centers, you know, connected communities and smart cities. Uh, we've got a, a food and beverage team. We, we touch a lot of critical human infrastructure. And there's always been this kind of baseline foundation between that infrastructure and sustainability. You know, everything that we design and build improves quality of life. Everything we design and build expands economic activity you know power is an input to everything water is an input to everything um and of course we, all, we always do it trying to minimize the impact that we have on the environment well it's clear with infrastructure that there are a number of big trends that will be impacting it and influencing the decision making around it over the next you know decade two decades three decades you pick the time horizon increasing urbanization uh, availability of resources, climate change. These are all things that will dramatically impact um, the delivery of critical human infrastructure. Um, and we're, we're seeing it from our clients. Like take climate change just as an example. All those industries I rattled off, you know, uh, our water utilities are responding to insurers questions about adapting to climate change. Sure. Power utilities are announcing massive net zero carbon commitments by mid-century. Um, telecommunications carriers are wondering what happens with extreme weather and all of the distributed infrastructure that we've got out in the field. Um, obviously, oil and gas and mining companies, a lot of them uh, are making really strong commitments to demonstrate that you know, they're good corporate stewards and they're trying to extend the life of their products. Um, people that own and operate data centers, you know, they recognize that's, that's energy intensive infrastructure. A lot of those people are household names. And so they're very keen um, to, to really think about how their products their services and how they intersect with the world uh, kind of comes together. And so for us, it's a really exciting time because, you know, across, across the clients we serve, um, there's a lot of clients that are kind of rushing head on to tackle these challenges. And as, as a problem solver for the problem solvers, we want to be there for them to help support them making decisions, um, de-risking new technologies, helping them deploy new technologies, helping them, you know, think through what does their future look like in five or 10 years, you know, as consulting engineers, what's the future hold for you? How do you prepare for that? Sure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really exciting time, um, in, in addressing a lot of those big trends. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And you mentioned, um, uh, a lot of things that I want to talk about. Um, but you know, and there's so much synergy obviously with, with my business and what we're doing around, um, solar energy development, battery storage, um, creating more kind of distributed microgrids and everything like that. Um, so it really is fascinating. I mean, you, you all do business all over the world. And I, I echo your sentiment because it seems like um, in the United States in particular, you know, that's really where all of my experience comes in. Uh, they're really, it really feels like the, the pedals kind of been put to the metal, the, the foot's been put on the gas as far as how are we going to address climate change? How are we going to make sure that our businesses and our world is, 
is here for another 100 or 500 or 1,000 years to come. And so um, that obviously has to create a lot of opportunity for you all in your business. And um, and I, I it's been interesting to me as a solar developer to see even in the Midwest where, you know, we joke all the time at Biostar that we live in the worst place in the United States to do our job uh, because there's very little renewable energy adoption around here. Um, but 2020, albeit sort of an anomaly with the pandemic, um, man, we just still see people really driving towards how do we get solar on our roofs? How do we reduce our energy consumption? What do I need to, when am I going to have battery storage on my building? Is it five years from now, 10 years from now? So we always try to keep our, um, you know, fingers on the pulse of that and what our, our customers are saying, but talk a little bit about how important, you know, the role of engineering companies is in that in that process going forward because we work with everybody from really large companies who have whole teams that are dedicated to this um, that i think still rely on outside engineering resources all the way down to you know somebody with a 10 or 12 person operation um, you know where they kind of just tacked sustainability onto the title director of operations so talk about the role of, of your company and other companies like yours to make these new cutting edge, exciting technologies really a reality. Yeah, you know, it's it's a wonderful opportunity for I think all engineering and construction firms. You know, we're we're by no means unique in in prioritizing sustainability. Um, you know, again, topics like climate change, resource availability. Um, managing urbanization, managing demographic changes. Like some of these things are really just all hands on deck, you know, kind of global problems that need to be solved. So there's there's an opportunity for everybody to participate and contribute. Companies like Black & Veatch, engineering and construction companies, you know, we, we sort of, our, our business is based in scientific principles. You know, we apply scientific principles in business every day to do the things I described earlier, you know, improve quality of life, expand economic activity and minimize the impact on the environment. So I, I think there's a amount, there, there's a certain amount of objective credibility given to companies in our space um, where we're seen as trusted advisors. Um, we, 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 our, our business model is really about providing, um, you know, strong recommendations, credible recommendations and those sorts of things. And so when it comes to deploying new technologies, when it comes to executing projects, I'm amazed every day at both the domain expertise that we've got at our company, but also the ability to, you know, pragmatically think through how do we execute a project? Um, you know, over time, our business has transitioned from uh, more central plant projects to more distributed mm -hmm. projects and as we've gone through that transition it's been amazing to see that we can scale from you know program managing deployment of you know hundreds of electric vehicle charging stations or mm -hmm. you know dozens of rooftop solar projects at once you know all the way up to executing mega projects so from a from a, a an execution perspective um, companies like Black and Beach have a role to play, you know, regardless of the scale, regardless of the solution, we'll find a way to execute that project. But then on the domain expertise piece, you know, there's, as, as, as you know, there's been tremendous amount written about hydrogen this year. Um, yeah. And, you know, we've participated in ammonia projects for 80 years. We've participated in a lot of things related to hydrogen, but as, as we've seen this market shift uh, here over the last year or so, we, we don't have to look too far within our own company to find people. They're already subject matter experts on hydrogen. You know, they supported yeah. this program at this utility or that program at that, you know, federal agency or what have you. And so um, from a capabilities perspective, um, we've got, you know, a ready deep bench of technologists, subject matter experts and scientists and engineers who are kind of ready to go based on, you know, to a certain extent, the cost profile of, of equipment. Um, you may know we, we, we actually don't own a lot of IP relative to some of our peers, 
were were largely technology agnostic. That's not true across the board, but we typically think of ourselves as technology integrators. And so what we bring to the table is relationships with the OEMs, relationships with the project sponsors, relationships with financiers, and we sort of bring people together to make projects happen. And so as we see a new wave of emerging technologies, you know, especially in decarbonization, whether it's green hydrogen, carbon capture utilization, sequestration, advanced renewables, battery energy storage, um, we, we can move quickly to kind of pull teams together to go execute on those sorts of things, regardless of the scale and not totally regardless of the geography, but you know, our, our global presence helps us in a lot of respects. We're not in every country by any stretch, but uh, we've got quite a bit of flexibility work across the globe. And so it's a really exciting time for us to work with all of those project participants on you know, figuring out the potential fate of flaws for executing a project, helping clients de-risk some of those emerging technologies, help them rapidly go through the, the cycle of learning on what works and what doesn't work on deploying technologies and integrating that equipment. Um, and right now we've got some really exciting opportunities that um, I, think, I think will result in some of those foundational decarbonization technologies that people will be talking about and deploying for you know, decades. So it's, it's a really That's exciting time. Yeah, absolutely. And since you, you went to hydrogen, I was kind of hoping you would go there. I think a lot of our viewers and listeners um, are in our industry, in the industry, sort of can really, you know, sink into this stuff and get deep on some of these topics. But I think a lot of them, too, stay at a higher level. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. Just kind of talk about you know, the acceleration of hydrogen and the implications it could have going into the future and just sort of educate our viewers at a high level for a couple of minutes about, you know, what this means. Well, and I'll, I'll do my best. I'll be perfectly honest. It's not a space that I'm 100% comfortable with and I'm still sure. learning every day. And it's one of those complex ecosystems where, you know, hydrogen can be produced in a lot of different ways. Hydrogen has okay. been, obviously, it's, it's, it's an industrial chemical. It's been produced for a long, long time. And historically, the way it's been produced is, is, is typically using fossil fuels. Um, I believe the process is steam methane reforming. I think that's what it's called. Um, not the cleanest process by any stretch, but you know, if you're a user of industrial hydrogen, then, then you need it, right? Um, but over time, um, there's a number of pathways to get to hydrogen. Um, electrolyzers, it's a piece of equipment that generates uh, hydrogen. I, I think it just, the byproduct is water maybe. It's a really clean technology. Um, the more you can run electrolyzers with, with clean energy, so maybe wind powered energy or solar powered energy, you can produce hydrogen fairly clean. Now, Right now, the cost of doing that doesn't make any sense for a power application relative to just using the wind energy or the solar energy. But at some point, hydrogen might become a storage mechanism. Yeah. Um, but hydrogen's nice because it's got a lot of flexibility in industrial applications like steel making, I think cement making maybe. Um, we're excited about it from the prospect of um, improving the, the kind of carbon emissions profile of a natural gas generating power plant. You can blend hydrogen with natural gas. Um, we're actually, we actually have the opportunity to work on uh, some of the, I think first, um, some of the first gas powered turbines that are getting blended with hydrogen. Uh, we're, we're, wow. We've got the opportunity to execute those projects. Um, but hydrogen's really flexible. You know, it's, it's been used for uh, transportation and mobility. We had the opportunity to execute a, a program of, of hydrogen fueling stations uh, in the western part of the United States for hydrogen-fueled cars, for fuel cells. Yep. Um, and so, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a molecule that's got a lot of flexibility in its, its use. It's got a lot of pathways to you know, <laughs> come into existence, as it were. Um, and I think over time, as you know, the cost profile for the equipment on some of those different pathways, and as the relative economics on the uses and you know, people's desire to decarbonize power, decarbonize transportation, decarbonize industry, 
you know, as, as all of that comes together, I think it's a molecule that's, it's, it's going to become pretty significant here, even in the next five years. Um, but it's really just, it's really just the beginning. Um, yeah, so. absolutely. And you mentioned energy storage, which we think, and I think there's a lot of schools of thought out there that, you know, perhaps the energy storage, the, the real solving that problem um, probably includes hydrogen. Um, and, and yeah, so that's really fascinating. And certainly if our viewers and listeners want to learn more about that topic, um, you'll have to find someone much smarter than me, um, one of Black and Veatch's engineers. Uh, but no, there's a lot on Google. And so, you know, Googling just a simple Google hydrogen um, as, as energy storage will turn up a lot of really interesting information. So let's dig in a little deeper to what you've really been doing the last year. Um, and forgive me if I don't know if you accelerate zero is kind of your baby, but that certainly popped out on your homepage. It's really featured there and an amazing plan you all have put together. Um, talk to me just about really what you've been doing in the last year and, and your approach as black and Veach to, um, you know, addressing all of these issues internally and, um, and and how you go forward how you achieve these these lofty goals that you've set yeah sure so um accelerate zero is is a bit of an umbrella for us you know we talked about um you know power utilities net zero carbon commitments a little while ago um and again as a solutions provider um, we like to be there for our clients as they're you know kind of developing their roadmap or they're, they're, they're testing technologies and de-risking technologies, they're deploying new technologies, they're decommissioning other technologies. So, so part of what sits under that Accelerate Zero umbrella is you know, our desire to be um, uh, alongside our clients as they're on that journey to net zero carbon. Some have made it for 2030, some have made it for 2040, some have made it for 2050. Um, obviously a lot of power utilities have made that commitment. A lot of commercial industrial clients, a lot of technology clients. Um, it's it's you know increasing in prevalence not just in the United States, um, but around the globe. Uh, a lot of our water utility clients in the UK, as an example, um, we've actually been helping them meet those requirements for a little bit longer. Um, so that's part of what's under the Accelerate Zero umbrella. Um, but there's also this recognition that whenever we talk about, you know, all of the pillars of, of sustainability and sustainability programs, um, there's a lot of things that we're trying to drive to zero, whether that's our own carbon footprint, you know, being a net zero operating company, whether that's driving towards becoming a zero waste company, whether it's driving towards, you know, zero instances of, you know, infractions on business ethics or um, safety incidences, those sorts of things. There's a lot of things where we're trying to drive to zero and really the sustainability strategy uh, for, for us is about uh, moving faster with our own internal program uh, than we have before. And so accelerating to our own net zero carbon commitment, accelerating to our own, you know, zero safety incidents commitment. Um, so there's, there's a lot to, um, you know, what kind of goes under that umbrella, but for us, Accelerate Zero is really an ethos about uh, moving fast on our own sustainability program. As you noted, we, we published a document uh, almost a month ago. Uh, it, was, it was, I believe, the second week in November, um, and it identifies the commitments that our executive committee um, rallied behind, and yeah. it, it includes net zero by 2025. We've, we've historically not tracked our water use as well. And so we've got some work to do to, to kind of come up with a baseline there. One of the things I'm really excited about, I talked about how we help our clients with their sustainability commitments. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our clients already expect us to build, you know, principles of sustainability into our work. We've actually got a commitment to do that across all of our project execution manuals. And so we'll go through a process, a stakeholder process in our company, um, you know, to figure out where can we really drive change? Where can we really support our clients best? And just, you know, continue to build that into the operating model. Um, sure. But we're an employee owned company. We, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're a professional services company. So 
we're all about people. And so we can never overlook the importance of continuing to improve on having an inclusive culture, having a safe culture, having an ethical culture. And so we've got some commitments around those things as well. Um, because, you know, like I say, at the end of the day, we're, we're a people business and we're an employee owned people business. So we really put people at the center of our strategy, both, you know, aspirationally, but also how we're going to get it done and uh, what we're expecting of our professionals to adopt as a culture. So it's a really exciting time. And, um, you know, to a certain extent, we're at the beginning of the journey. Um, yeah. And so I'm really looking forward to 2021. We've got a lot of work to kick off. Um, and a lot of enthusiasm and engagement and energy from our professionals to do that work. And so for some of our folks who are listening that might have their own small or medium-sized or large business uh, and are starting to think about that sort of roadmap you alluded to, how do I get there? Where do I start? Um, that can be sort of daunting and, and scary, frankly. Uh, like, how do I start, right? And so you mentioned uh, recording a baseline and I saw online that you all are um, evaluating and creating a baseline for your water consumption and I think greenhouse gas emissions in 2021. So you have to set that baseline, right? Talk about the importance of really knowing where you start before you can set a goal and, and know how to get there. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's in, I'd, I'd encourage companies to think of it even, you know, upstream of that just a little bit. Like what's important? Like, what are your priorities? Um, we, we engaged our professionals on a couple of questions um, at the beginning of the year. Actually, it was right before we all started working from home. So we got lucky because, you know, the survey responses weren't colored by everybody's recent experience with, you know, experiencing the pandemic and working from home. Right. Um, but we asked our professionals, you know, hey, of, of this laundry list of sustainability topics, what's most important? And, you know, maybe even more important than that question, like, where do we feel like we can have an impact? Where do we have an influence? And so just starting with that almost scoping question of, you know, what, what's important to us? What should we prioritize? What do we need to put on our agenda? Um, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, are, are we creating alignment with our clients? Are we creating alignment with our supply chain? You know, we don't, we don't necessarily want to go off into left field and do something that nobody that we, we work with really, you know, prioritizes. And so uh, for us, we, we, we asked our employees what was important, where we could have an impact. And then we looked at same thing on our clients. Where, what are they prioritizing? And that's where we developed that list of things that we were going to spend our time building continuous improvement plans around. So, so first question is really what, what's important? What do we want to prioritize? And from there, you know, it's just the old adage. You can't, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so yeah. whatever it is that you prioritize, you've got to understand, you know, the, the metrics, the, the, the data around whatever that is. Um, just using carbon footprint as an example, we were fortunate that we've actually had a lot of clients expect that we provide that data over the last five years. And so mm -hmm. we've, we've done a really good job calculating our, our operational carbon footprint over that time. Um, and now the, the switch is, okay, well, let's do something with that data. Let's use it, um, you know, as actionable information to, to, to you, know, you know, throttle the switch down here and throttle in a different direction over there. Sure. Um, so yeah, setting that baseline is really important because if you don't have that, you really don't have anything that you can manage to. Once you have that baseline, you can decide, well, how ambitious do I want to be on making a commitment to, you know, cut this by 10% or increase that by 20%. Um, and it's really a stakeholder engagement process with leadership to determine, you know, how aspirational and ambitious do we want to be. And from there, it's really just a question of, what actions do I need to take to, you know, cut that 10% or to add that 20% to something else? Sure. And then you just sort of build up a portfolio of actions that need to happen and develop business cases around them. So that's sort of the simple model for it. You know, there's a lot to it. And for all of the dimensions that, that we've identified commitments we wanted to make, it's going to be a little bit different for each one. Um, but um, that that's really the process that has seemed to work well so far. And, um, it's, it's a, it's a good playbook at this point. You know, a lot of companies have sort of been on this sustainability, this corporate sustainability journey. And so, um, there's a lot of great resources that you can find, um, online or in books to do that work. 
Well, we certainly feel that in our business, um, you know, feel people really trying to, to get a grasp um, for, you know, how much carbon are they, are they emitting or how can we adopt a sustainability plan? What does that look like? Black & Veatch is certainly leading by example, been doing it for 105, almost 106 years, which is just a, a massive accomplishment. Um, and keep up the good work, Brian. I, you know, when we started this thing, we started a podcast in a pandemic, uh, which is kind of strange. And I'm really looking forward to the day when I actually bring folks into my office who are local, uh, not right down the street from me, and they can come in and we can sit and we can record this thing in person. So I really hope you'll come back because you're, you're working on so many awesome projects. And like I said, really leading by example, um, certainly if you're listening to this show and you have a project that you're interested in, um, or anything that Brian mentioned, uh, sort of, you know, rung a bell or, or, you know, made the light bulb go off in your head and, and you want to ask some questions, I I'm sure Brian would be more than happy to answer them. Brian, how do we find you online? Uh, do you tweet? Are you on LinkedIn? How can folks get a hold of you if they're interested to have a conversation? Well, hey, thanks for all your kind comments, David. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you pulling the podcast together. Uh, this is great sources of information for for a lot of us that uh, um, like to listen to things of interest as opposed to read to things of interest. So I appreciate sure, you sure. doing it. And I love the fact that it's Kansas City based. It's wonderful. Um, I am I am more apt to be on LinkedIn than uh, Twitter. So you can yeah. always search for me on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm happy to connect with people through that channel. Uh, we can message for a moment and then find some time off the LinkedIn uh, page to, to connect up. So yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. Excellent. Well, Brian, thanks again for coming on. Happy holidays. Uh, we're recording this in December and, and Christmas and New Year, just right around the corner. So happy holidays to you. Stay safe. And uh, I look forward to having you back in 2021. Well, hey, likewise to you. Happy holidays. Stay safe. And yeah, absolutely. I look forward to reconnecting in the new year. And hopefully it will be when uh, we are all able to gather uh, in more than a few people at a time. So I look forward to that right. for sure. Right. Excellent. Well, thanks again, everyone. Search for Brian on LinkedIn. Check out Black & Veatch online. Uh, really encourage everybody to look at their Accelerate Zero program. It's just a, a really cool um sort of model for i think what a lot of companies are really trying to do right now so um, thanks again this is another episode of renewables i'm your host david smart we'll see you next time <laughs>